It's amazing what is given in the Old Testament, as it's been said recently in several sermons and talks that will help us be godly as we live for the Lord and the church. And I would like for us to bring back up again a man who we've looked at earlier, and that is Lot, the nephew of Abraham. His life is rather uh, an intriguing one, and yet when we look at him, even though the Holy Spirit had Peter call him a righteous man, whose righteous life was vexed by the terrible immorality of Sodom. There's still a great lesson to learn about choices that we make, which choices on the surface, or at least they appear at the beginning, not to be wrong at all. And we see then that we can learn a great deal about human nature in looking at a lot of these people, not all of them selected by the Spirit in the Old Testament. People haven't changed in their thinking, in their nature. Even though society today is considerably different from what it was when I was a young person, teenager, but even then it hadn't changed, as you might think it had, only from the standpoint of a lot more people doing a lot more mean things. And a world that not only just tolerates it, uh, a nation that encourages it and says, this is all right, this is fine, this is the way to go. Be that as it may, people are people when it comes to the way they think, operate, plan, purpose, and view things. That's one reason you have, through Moses, God telling the people of Israel that thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil, Exodus 23, 2. Why? You shouldn't follow anyone to do evil. It's just that it's a whole lot easier to go with the crowd. And that's the way it is in our nation today. A lot of the things that used to be in society that would hinder a person from doing a lot of the wicked things that people regularly do now and think nothing of it, uh, that kind of thing has changed. Paul was correct in stating that evil companionships corrupt good morals, 1 Corinthians 15, I might pause here in regarding that statement and say you don't have to be with them in the flesh and blood before you or a companion of them. Just uh, enjoy the television shows that uphold transvestites and transgender and homosexuality and adultery and, oh, I'm talking about soap operas, thousands and thousands of people watch, not Just have a companion with those and your companion of the same. And even more so when it comes to the matter of the internet. So there's more and more opportunity to be a bad person nowadays than maybe there has been in the past. But nevertheless, that's the way people are, and we need to know that it's necessary to be faithful to the Lord to learn to stand on your own two feet. And by that I mean make your own choices based solely upon the truth, and those choices should lead you toward the truth and with the people who love the truth rather than those who go contrary to it. It's just next to impossible to convince most people that there is a right, there is a way that seemeth right to a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death, Proverbs 14, 12. When Lot decided to seek the well-watered plains of Jordan, Genesis 13, 10, we know, without it being revealed to us, because, as I said, Peter in inspiration called him a righteous man, that he had no idea that the choice, being a herdsman, that he made was going to lead him to so much terrible pain, heartache, and loss. It wasn't far ahead of him 
when he made up his mind to choose the better place that was good for flocks and herds. And he was, for his day and time, exceedingly wealthy for those people at that time. One of the things that he did that may not readily stand out is that Abraham gave him the choice. You take this, I'll take that. You take that, I'll take this. So Lot chose. And notice that Lot chose on the basis of his own interest and his own physical realm and well-being as a herdsman. He didn't look beyond that. Yet the direction that that put him in and what seemingly was an innocent decision and a good business decision headed him a direction that he certainly wouldn't have said I would go if he just said I'm going to go through all of this. We need then to learn to choose more correctly from not only viewing Lot's life but whole lot of the others that are in the Old Testament. Lot simply made a bad choice. Verses 1 or 11 through 12 of chapter 13 read, So Lot chose him all the plain of the Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves the one from the other. Abraham dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain, and moved his tent as far as Sodom. He pitched his tent toward Sodom. Now the next time we read about him, he's going to be in Sodom. But you don't get in Sodom unless you go toward Sodom. And he made a deliberate choice that put him in that direction. Paul talked about in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 7, For we walk by faith and not by sight. That is, since the Word of God creates faith, then we walk as the Word of God leads and guides us and directs us. And we ought to then make those choices, even in our livelihoods and whatever we do, that puts us in a better position to be closer to God than other things of this present world. Lot didn't do that. He should have been a person who was more mindful of being close to a godly person. Now think about it for a minute. For his day and time in patriarchy, he knew what kind of man Abraham was. He knew the faithfulness of Abraham to God. Wouldn't you want to be as close to Abraham as you possibly could be for that day and age as far as service to God, love of God, faith in God? Abraham's called the friend of God. He would obey God no matter what. You don't get that idea as to the strength of the faith of Lot at all. If we're determined to follow then our own feelings, our own desires as they fit this present world, and if we're going to yield to those desires, it's inevitable that we will pitch our tent toward Sodom. Rearing children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord means we instill them in that by our choices and examples as parents as well as teaching them they should make those kind of choices. Because we have power to steer them. They get out on their own and they decide to pitch their tent towards Sodom. They can do it. But then don't be surprised. They needn't be surprised that they don't end up in Sodom. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 1, Paul says to every Christian as he wrote to the church in Colossae, seek the things that are above. Now, let me ask you, in the patriarchal age, did Lot seek the things that are above? Look what he had in, in Abraham. But it doesn't seem like being with Abraham was helping him that much. Again, the great principle that's often Overlook, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. I see it violated in Lot. Lot looked at what was right there before his eyes. A herdsman made a good business deal and chose a place where his flocks and herds could graze and graze and graze. And you see where he wound up. 
God would have taken care of him if he had thought in his mind, I don't want to get too close to that place. I want to be more like Abraham. But he didn't. It's a, it's a tragic mistake that many have made for people to become so involved or consumed with worldly matters. Not necessarily they're wrong in themselves. There was nothing wrong with a well-watered plain uh, of Jordan for a shepherd. Nothing wrong with that at all. But it's that one gradual step, incremental step that moves you further away. And you have to choose where you go on the basis of something. There has to be something going on in your mind that says, I'm going to go this way or not go that way or whatever. And here is where he failed. You find, of course, that if you look at Jesus' teaching in Matthew chapter 7, 26 through 27, who the wise man was. He built his house on the rock. And then the foolish man built his house on the sand. Now, a question. Would you say Lot built his house on a rock or on the sand? Lot next is seen in the scriptures in Sodom. Wrong position. He didn't need to be there. It is said in Genesis 19.1, Lot sat in the gate of Sodom. Now, you remember later on when that motley crowd was trying to demand that he send the two men out for immoral purposes. You remember they said, you come in among us a stranger and judge us. Well, the place of judgment of those ancient cities was in the gate. And that might very well be where they learned what Lot thought about their conduct because he says he sat in the gate of Sodom. I don't know that for sure. But they found out some way that he thought what they were doing was wicked. They didn't like it. But he wouldn't have had to subject himself to that if he hadn't chosen what seemed to be an innocent thing. But it wasn't so innocent. The scripture says that he didn't enjoy those people. They vexed him. Have you ever been vexed? <laughs> we don't use that term much anymore. We would say bothered, aggravated, irritated. That's the lifestyle of the people of Sodom, and that's the way it affected Lot. But then you might say, Lot, you moved in here. Can't you move out? Well, sometimes when we make those choices based on things like he did and you get yourself all involved, it makes it a lot harder to move out than it was to get there in the first place. To mix and mingle with those who are worldly in speech and action is no evidence that one is growing in the knowledge and practice of the truth. Or as Peter said in 2 Peter 3.18, that we're to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We as members of the church, God's children and the family of God, should heed the warning of the great Apostle Paul when he said, and so should Lot have learned this, even in patriarchy, be not unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what fellowship have righteousness with iniquity or unrighteousness. American Standard reads, Or what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what portion hath a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For we are a temple of the living God, even as God said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come ye out from among them and be ye separate. 2 Corinthians 6, 14-17. Listen, faithful members of the church and all the New Testament teaches that to mean can only get so close to non-members. They can't become your, quote, bosom buddies, unquote. 
They can't be that close to where they and their lifestyle will begin to rub off on you. You're going to have to keep them, for lack of a better way to put it, at arm's length. Nice to them. Associate with them. Help them any way you could. But you can't party with them. <laughs> you're not going to be able to. Their interest is not your interest if you're what God says you ought to be as a child. And in every case, when you start being that close to worldly people and ungodly people, no matter how friendly they are, no matter what they would do for you to help you, it's going to rub off on you. It's going to influence you. And it won't be for good. It never has. Look for a moment at the message that Lot received. The angel said concerning why they had come to Sodom. For we will destroy this place because the cry of them is waxed great before Jehovah. And Jehovah has sent us to destroy it. Genesis 19.13 Simple, wicked places and abominable acts will incur the wrath of God. How close do you want to be to those kind of people if that kind of thing begins to impact you? All ungodliness will one day be confined to the horrors of hell. All of it. None will be left out. The message in the Christian dispensation is as clear as it can be. The inspired apostle Paul told the Corinthians, or know you not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate homosexuals, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, shall inherit the kingdom of God. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 10. You don't make friends with those folks. You say, well, how am I going to convert them? Well, you don't convert them by going down to the bar and having a glass of beer with them while you discuss Acts chapter 2. And that is even being done by some of our brethren who would know the Bible. I don't know what to compare it to. From a cuckoo burn. You can't do that. But some of this idea of saying, well, I'm a sinner, you're a sinner, I'm just forgiven and you're not. Well, then you can just kind of walk down that same path and say, look here, I'm just like you. But you're not if you're faithful to God. The way you think is not like the world. The way you speak is not like the world. The choices you make is not like the world. You're a new creature in Christ. Your whole outlook on life has changed. Look at the influence that this man possessed. Scripture reads, And Lot went out and spake unto his sons-in-law, who had married his daughters, and said, Up, get you out of this place, for Jehovah will destroy this city. Now this next statement has always intrigued me. What was the impact of Lot's statement? And they didn't know what kind of man he was, too, if these wicked people knew what kind of man he was. But notice how his words affected them. But he seemed unto his son-in-law as one that mocked. They didn't take anything seriously that he said. It was just a light matter. Look the world around about us. Look at the people who are mired in their way of life and all of these ungodly things. And a sermon like this is as if one mocked and made light of it. Some sort of religious stand-up comic. That's what it amounts to. Our actions speak much louder than our words. If one makes only self-serving choices in this particular life, then the words that 
and are spoken by our Lord, the words of the Bible will ring hollow in our ears. There comes a point in time where neither earnestness nor action will overcome inconsistency. Lastly, the reluctance that Lot demonstrated when it came to leaving. The scripture reads, but he lingered. That's Lot. But he lingered. And the men laid hold upon his hand. That's the angels. And upon the hand of his wife. And upon the hand of his two daughters. Jehovah being merciful unto him. And they brought him forth and set him without the city. Genesis 19, 16. In fact, they even told him, we cannot destroy this city until you're out of here. Now, I'll come back and say, yes, he was a righteous man. But the thing that chills me is that righteous men can make such choices that it plunges themselves, or their soul may be saved, into such a mess that it tears up everything they love and hold most dear. He had great possessions and he lingered. I don't know how he had converted, if such had been the case, his flocks and herds into whatever put him into the city of Sodom. It was characteristic of those ancient cities that people lived in the cities and went out into the plains or to the fields to do their work and then for safety purposes came back in at night when the doors were shut. Bible is quiet on that. We don't know. But I do know something caused him to hold back when he knew and believed God was going to destroy that city. A city whose actions he abhorred. And the people around about him who loved it knew he felt that way about it. So is there profit to such a study? Yes, there is. We were mentioning some of us before services. All things are lawful to me, but all things are not expedient. They're not advantageous to me. They don't help me get closer to God. And we must understand that. And because they don't, they can put us into a, we'd say we got ourselves a pickle. And Lot got himself into a pickle. His wife, well, she was commanded, as they all were, not to look back. But she did. And God punished her. So think about that, especially young people. When you're choosing the course of your life, what you're going to do with your life, the direction you're trying to go, it may seem rather innocent and may be within itself, but it may be the well-watered plains of the Jordan and you'll be pitching your tent toward Sodom, not ever intending to be a part of it but before you know what you are. And then it's awful hard to divest yourself of those things where you put down roots. So there's great lessons in this on wisdom. Wisdom is the proper way to use knowledge. And Lot didn't do that. Well, you may save yourself, but you may lose all sorts of things for choosing those well-watered plains. If you're not a child of God, we have an opportunity to become just that this afternoon. To believe that Christ is the Son of God, repenting of your sins, confessing your faith in Him, and being baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. If you've done that, you've wandered away from Him, sins entered your life. I imagine it entered in, if it did, in a very subtle way. You can recognize it. You can divest yourself of it by repenting of it and confessing it and praying God for forgiveness. One of the wonderful things is that we can all work together in fellowship with God in harmony with the teaching of the New Testament to help us all be better and to dodge out on a lot of these things that sometimes we get ourselves into. So if you're subject to the invitation of Jesus Christ, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.